This is a News 4 special presentation. Decision 2020, the race for U.S. Senate in Virginia. Democratic Senator Mark Warner and Republican challenger Daniel Gade. The candidates face off in a debate with Virginians already voting during a pandemic. Now, from the Meet the Press studios in Washington, here's NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Hello there, I'm Chuck Todd and welcome to the Virginia Senate debate between Democratic Senator Mark Warner and Republican candidate Daniel Gade, made possible by the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, and NBC4 and Telemundo 44. This debate is airing on NBC stations across Virginia and streaming on NBCWashington.com. You'll notice a few things are a bit different in this debate because of the pandemic. The candidates, panelists, and myself are all in separate locations, as you can see here. There's no live audience. Instead, they're joining us virtually via Zoom, thanks to the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. What hasn't changed, this debate will provide an opportunity to find out where these candidates stand on issues that are important to Virginia voters. So let's begin by quickly covering the rules for today's event. The debate will last one hour and we'll begin with one and a half minute opening statements from each candidate. Then our panelists and I will pose questions directly to the candidates. I should note these questions are determined by NBC News and the panelists and have not been reviewed by the candidates or any of the debate partners. Each candidate will have one minute to respond and the candidate answering first will get an additional 30 second rebuttal. And as moderator, I will reserve the right to follow up as needed. Finally, we will conclude the debate with one minute closing statements. There is a timekeeper who will notify both candidates of their remaining time and when time has expired. In the interest of trying to cover as much ground as possible, we ask the candidates to adhere to these time limits. And now let's welcome our panelists. It's News 4 Today anchor, Aaron Gilchrist. News 4 Northern Virginia Bureau Chief, Julie Carey. And Telemundo 44 reporter, Alberto Pimienta. All joining us from NBC4 Studios in Washington. And now the candidates, both in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. It's Republican challenger, Daniel Gade, and Democratic incumbent, Senator Mark Warner. Dr. Gade, your one and a half minute opening statement comes first. Well, good morning and thank you, or good afternoon, I guess. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for having us on. Thank you for moderating this, uh, Chuck. Throughout my life, I've faced many challenges and forks in the road. I've always tried to do the hard right thing instead of the easy wrong one. I was an army officer for many years and gave a leg in combat, but there's much more. I have a master's degree and a PhD in public policy and have used those skills in tough bipartisan policy areas, like formulating wounded warrior policy at the White House during a time when Congress and the White House were in different hands. And serving on the bipartisan National Council on Disability, shaping policies that help the most disadvantaged members of our society. These are not left versus right issues, they are American issues. And as I've campaigned around the Commonwealth for the past 15 months, I've consistently heard that the same old stale ideas aren't working for Virginians. Because we face tough challenges right now, and it will take a true commitment to working across the aisle with people of the other side to solve them. Recovering the economy and fixing our health care after COVID shouldn't be a partisan idea. We all breathe the same air and drink the same water. And the veteran suicide crisis has gotten worse, not better, under the same old people with the same old ideas. And the contrast between me and Mark couldn't be more clear. I'm a career servant with a mortgage and the everyday worries of middle class life. Mark is a career partisan who made millions off of political handouts and who cynically talks about reducing insulin prices for diabetic children while taking three quarters of a million dollars from Big Pharma in campaign contributions. So if you're sick of career politicians, let's choose a different path. Senator Warner, your opening statement. Well, thank you, Chuck, and thank you to the uh, the Virginia Chamber, Northern Virginia Chamber. Uh, I also want to start by giving a shout out to all the frontline workers, especially our postal workers. I know today we're going to be sharing our differences, uh, but I do want to start by thanking Mr. Gade for his service and his sacrifice. I think we all know that Virginia and our country are in challenging times. I spent 25 years in business here in Virginia, creating jobs. I then went into public service because I wanted to get stuff done. And that means you got to work together. As governor, Virginia was named the best managed state and the best state for business. 
As your senator, I've been proud to have 55 of my bills become law. Laws that cut, small, cut red tape for small businesses. Laws that improved uh, our shipbuilding businesses in Hampton Roads. That improved the quality of Medicare. And just last month, the president signed my legislation that made the largest investment in our National Park Service and helped create, will help create 10,000 jobs here in Virginia. But right now, we know that what we've got to do is save lives and get the economy started again. And that means dealing with the coronavirus. And that will require following the science. But the truth is, even before the pandemic, our economy was changing. We need leaders who understand that every Virginian ought to have a fair shot in our tech-driven economy. And that's been my focus my entire career. It's been the honor of my life to serve Virginia, and I hope to earn your vote again. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, thank you. I want to begin now on the topic of the Supreme Court, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death and what happens to her seat and when. Dr. Gade, you do get the first question. Explaining his justification in pushing forward with a replacement before the upcoming election, President Trump said, when you have the Senate, when you have the votes, you can sort of do what you want as long as you have it. Dr. Gade, do you agree with that statement? And how do you think the Senate should proceed? Well, I've been a servant of the Constitution for the past 25 years in the Army and then later as a, as a political appointee in the Trump administration. And here's what I'd say about this. In 2016, I think the Senate erred in not bringing Merrick Garland to an up or down vote because it's the president's authority and the Senate's responsibility to appoint and then either confirm or refuse to confirm a Senate appointee. And in that, I actually agree with 2016 mark. Let's call that, let's call that flip mark. Because flip mark said, hashtag do your job, give him an up or down vote. And I think that they should have done that in 2016. And the president's authority to appoint and the, Supreme, and, the, and the Senate's responsibility to either confirm or not confirm an appointee does not expire around the time of an election. And it's time for the Senate to hashtag do their job. It's time for the, if the president appoints somebody, it's time for the Senate to take a vote. And let's do our constitutional responsibility. And in this, in this case, flop mark says that's a bad idea. So which is it? Is it going to be flip flop? Flip or flop? Excuse me. Senator Warner, which, which precedent? Uh, is incorrect by the Republicans, the one from 16 or the one they're doing now? Well, Chuck, let's first of all take a moment and reflect on the legacy of Justice Ginsburg. Um, she was a great jurist. I've got three daughters in their 20s. They live in a more open and just America because of Justice Ginsburg. And I actually agree with Mr. Gay. I wish the Senate had taken up Merrick Garland back in 2016. But the rules changed. Mitch McConnell said, we won't do that. So now there's a new precedent. And I think particularly now, when Virginians are already voting, we ought to wait and let Americans decide, let them have their votes counted before we decide who becomes the next Supreme Court justice. Because the next Supreme Court justice is gonna deal with incredibly important things. One of the first issues the court will take up, actually two weeks after the election, is the viability of the Ameri Affordable Care Act, something my opponent has criticized me for uh, throughout his whole campaign. I think the ACA needs to stay in place because the truth is the only law that protects people with pre-existing conditions is the ACA. 20 million Americans that have got health care, ACA. 400,000 Virginians with um, Medicaid expansion, ACA. That is at stake along with a host of other issues. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Gade, you get 30 seconds. Well, sure. I think what you see here is a contrast. You know, career politicians want to have it both ways. And by the way, Republican career politicians want to have it both ways. And that's a good, that's a good critique of the 2016 ver Senate versus the 2020 Senate. In that, I agree with Mark. But what I don't agree with Mark on is that the rules, once, they've, once somebody's bent the rules, that it's okay to continue to bend the rules. In fact, we have a responsibility to fulfill our constitutional responsibilities. And that means we have to confirm or, de or refuse to confirm whatever Supreme Court justice the, the president puts up. And he's right. The Supreme Court is critically important. And in the unlikely but dangerous event of a, of a uh, contested election where it goes to the Supreme Court, as it did in 2000, we can't, we can't afford to have a four to four Supreme Court. All right, gentlemen, thank you. I want to move to the next topic. I want to turn to the topic of why we're conducting this debate remotely and not in person. 
It's the coronavirus. As of today, the virus has killed more than 200,000 Americans, including more than 3,000 in the state of Virginia. The unemployment rate in the state has gone from 3.3% in March to 6.1% today. What more should the federal government and the U.S. Senate be doing to fight the virus and help Virginia? Senator Warner, you get the first response. Well, Chuck, uh, the remarkable thing about coronavirus is it didn't have to be this way. Uh, I reached out to the Trump administration in January before there was a single case in Virginia saying, do you need more resources? Instead, I think we have seen an epic failure from this White House. We're seven months in. We still don't have a national testing plan. We still don't have a plan on PPE. And on this issue, my opponent and I could not be more different. My opponent is called wearing masks a sign of tyranny. I think it's a sign of respect. He says the coronavirus is no more than the common flu. 200,000 Americans dead refute that. He says Donald Trump has done a good job of managing the coronavirus. I dramatically disagree. I was there with Secretary Mnuchin putting in place the first COVID relief package, help for small business, help for unemployment, additional assistance uh, for our hospitals and healthcare systems. Matter of fact, what we should be doing right now is not rushing a Supreme Court decision through the Congress. Mitch McConnell should bringing up the House pass bill so that we can get additional assistance for small business, so that schools can reopen safely, so we can actually start making the kind of investments in broadband that we need to have so that we don't have this kind of uh, uh, crazy Zoom driven economy. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Dr. Gade, your one minute. Thank you. You know, this is a this is a once in a lifetime pandemic. At least I hope it's a once in a lifetime pandemic. Um, 200,000 Americans are dead and our economy is totally disrupted. I agree with that. Tens of thousands of jobs right here in Virginia are gone forever. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, my opponent says I don't wear a mask. As a matter of fact, he sent out a mailer saying I don't wear a mask and that I call it tyranny. He's, he's wrong about that. I've got my mask right here. It's camouflage to honor my uh, 25 years of military service. But Americans have a right to be angry right now. The Chinese Communist Party hid the pandemic. Politicians who profited on the politicians profited on their knowledge of what was coming before citizens knew and other politicians delayed needed relief in that I'm pointing directly at you Senator Warner because you voted against 105 billion dollars to reopen schools 258 billion dollars for a, for a second round of protection for through the paycheck protection plan and $31 billion for a COVID vaccine and $16 billion for testing. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say this is important and then vote against the needs of Virginia's citizens. Senator Warner, 30 seconds. Well, I'm very proud of the record. I worked with Republicans back on the March COVID relief package. Most significant investment actually in, in our history of our country, $2.7 trillion. You're right, I didn't vote for a recent plan that would have allowed our cities and counties to go bankrupt. I don't think it makes any sense to go ahead and fire teachers, cops and firefighters in the middle of a debate. I think we actually got to go between where the Democrats are and the Trump administration. We should get a deal. We need relief. And again, one of the areas where my opponent and I dramatically disagree, and he did say wearing masks is tyranny, he says Donald Trump has done a great job of managing coronavirus. You talk about somebody who misled us, it was Donald Trump when he right. did not tell the American public the truth about the virus. Very quickly to both of you. First to you, Senator Warner, what grade would you give the president and his handling of the virus? Just very quickly. I I would give the president a failing grade because okay. we need additional relief and All we right. need to follow the science. Dr. Gade, what would you give the president? What grade? Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd give our country overall about a B minus or a C plus. I think that's a, a good grade, okay. or that's a, about the right accurate grade. Okay. Uh, Aaron Gilchrist has the next question. Aaron? Dr. Gade, since the pandemic hit, Senator Warner has held socially distanced in-person events with mask wearing, while you've attended in-person campaign events with little social distancing or mask wearing in different parts of the state. Uh, wh why do you consider your approach a safe way to gather and campaign? Well, Aaron, what we've done in this campaign, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of, because what we've done is, you know, look, I consider a campaign to be a job interview. And my responsibility as I go around, this, around the Commonwealth is to interview for this job. And so I have to meet the folks where they are. And when we do events that are inside, we do masks. Sometimes we do temperature checks where it's appropriate. 
And when we do events outside, we spread apart and we stay apart from each other and we, and we do those things in a socially distanced way. But at the end of the day, a coronavirus is gonna be with us for a very long time. And what we can't do is give in to uh, fear. What we have to do though, is protect people who are, um, who are vulnerable. And by the way, we need to get our economy back to work, which is why I would have absolutely voted for the most recent uh, coronavirus relief bill, which would have gotten schools back to work, which would have provided money for testing, which would have um, given money for the Paycheck Protection Plan. And that's something that Mark Warner voted against. And only in Washington, D.C. is not getting everything you want justification for giving nothing to your constituents. Senator Warner, one minute. 200,000 Americans are dead. The president has misled the American public in terms of the seriousness of the virus. My opponent, it's fairly, it's all recorded, called wearing mask tyranny, says coronavirus was very little more than the flu. He praised the president for his leadership. I think the only way we're going to get our economy reopened. And I'd point out the president even selected me, one of the few Democrats, to be on his economy reopening task force because he knew I brought that kind of business experience. But the only way we're going to get the economy reopened is if we follow the science, follow Dr. Fauci. Uh, and, if, and I actually believe wearing this mask is a sign of respect for the people I come in contact with. And yes, that is the way we've practiced as I've been out campaigning, following the science. And I very much believe we need another package. Matter of fact, what my opponent is suggesting, the Republican plan didn't even get all the Republican votes. It was one third of what even the Trump administration proposed. Let's get real. Let's do a real plan that will help get the assistance to reopen our schools, to make sure our state and local governments can succeed. But that's going to require bipartisan efforts the same way we did in March of this year when we put the CARES package together. Dr. Gate, 30 seconds. Yeah, you know, he keeps coming back to this idea that somehow uh, paying state and local governments and, and bailing them out is a good idea. And what I would say, if you've studied any public policy at all, you know that Chicago and New York and cities up and down uh, California have been failing for decades because they've made promises to their retirees and promises to their public sector unions they can't possibly keep. And so the idea of sending Virginia tax dollars to bail out failing state and local governments around the country because they've now made an excuse on this is a terrible mistake. It's a failure of public policy that goes back 40 or 50 years. And the same old politicians are not going to be able to solve it by giving them a bailout on our national credit card. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gay. Julie Carey has the next question. Julie. Senator Warner, as an entrepreneur, you brought new technology into Americans' hands. And later, as you began to build your political profile, you helped expand broadband to thousands of Virginians, many in rural areas. And that's something you often highlight as part of your record. But the pandemic has exposed just how many Virginia school kids and their families are still without broadband access. You estimate as many as 700,000 people. You've been in the Senate since 2009. Why, with your unique expertise, haven't you been able to do more to close the digital divide? Well, Julie, thank you for that question. I, I do want to just correct uh, one thing about Mr. Gay. He needs to do a little more of his homework. In Virginia, we're really proud of our AAA bond rating, something that I maintained when I was governor. We're really proud that our state and local governments actually are fiscally well managed. And I think it is wrong to cut off assistance to them and have cops, firefighters, and teachers laid off during the midst of a pandemic. It's just a difference of a position on uh, that issue. And I'm very proud of the fact that we have, during my tenure as senator, put millions of dollars in ad into additional broadband deployment. A lot of that coming after the 2008 crisis. I think we should do more though. I think we need to go ahead and provide ubiquitous high-speed broadband across the whole country, make the same commitment that Franklin Roosevelt made in the 1930s with rural elect electrification. We can do that now. I think there are things that we should be doing during the pandemic where we actually allow existing internet service providers to turn up the power so there's additional relief provided. And honestly, I think we ought to go ahead and be bold and say to our Server, or social media companies, the Facebooks, Googles, and yes, Amazon, maybe you ought to be chipping in for those underserved Americans. Broadband in 2020 is an economic necessity, not a nice to have. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Gate, one minute. Well, Chuck, you guys might have to check uh, Senator Warner's earpiece because I clearly said uh, 
uh, I didn't say anything about Virginia. I said something about Chicago and New York and, and uh, California. So uh, you might want to check his earpiece. Here's the thing. The question was about 5G. The question is, or sorry, about, about broadband. The question is really about access. And the federal government does have a role here. I would, I would say not similar to the rural electrification of the 1930s, but instead to the highway system that was built during the Eisenhower administration, the interstate highway system. Very similar problem, very similar solution. We need to build information superhighways. But laying cable is not always and not even the only solution. As a matter of fact, there are a couple other ways that we can accomplish the same goal of getting internet access to folks who need it. Things like using abandoned white space that's, that was gotten away from when TV went to digital. Things like using low Earth orbit satellites to beam down, um, to beam down wireless access. That's been something that's been very positive. The tests are very, um, are very encouraging, and, and SpaceX thinks they can do that by next year. And then finally, we need to get our hands around 5G, and this is an area in which uh, you know, the Chinese are leaps and bounds ahead of us, and half measures aren't going to do it from the United States Congress. Thank you, Dr. Gate. 30 seconds, Senator Warner. Well, I wish again my opponent would do his, his homework a little more. Um, I've actually been working with Microsoft in Southside, Virginia, to do white space experimentation on that last mile problem. I've been a huge supporter of commercial satellite for years to make sure, again, we have an alternative for delivery. And over the last two and a half years, I've led the bipartisan effort in the Senate to come up with plans to counter China. And my opponent's right. 5G, China has finally taken the lead. I'm leading from the Intelligence Community Committee on how we counter that in 5G and frankly even into the next generation of wireless called ORAN, bipartisan legislation that has already been put into the defense Thanks, authorization Senator. bill that would make national okay. commitments there. Thank, thank you, Senator. Uh, Alberto Pimiento has our next question. Alberto. Dr. Gate, uh, data from the Virginia Department of Health uh, shows that Latinos represent more than 30 percent of coronavirus cases in the state when they only account for 10 percent of the population, about 10 percent of the population, rather. The percentage is even higher in places like Fairfax County. What do you think is necessary to stop the spread of this virus in the Latino community and what kind of commitment you would make today in order to help the Hispanic population be safe from COVID-19? Yeah, you're exactly right. It's a huge problem, not just in the Latino community, but also in the, in the black community around the Commonwealth and around the country. There are a couple of underlying things that, are, that have been problems since before COVID, and that, are, that is that there are health disparities across the country in minority communities. And we need to do everything we can to help folks get the health care they need, including preventative care, so that their, that their overall quality of health comes up, so that when there's a uh, pandemic like what we're experiencing right now, there's room to, uh, that, they can, that they can thrive through it. And again, I just want to point back to the fact that my opponent says he wanted a whole loaf, and so he, didn't wa he wanted a whole loaf, and so he wasn't willing to take the half a loaf that he says the Republicans offered him. But by the way, that half a loaf would have offered over $30 billion for a vaccine and $16 billion for testing. And those are things that benefit not just the minority communities, but the rest of the country at large. And we should have, uh, we should have passed that bill. Thank you, Dr. Gates. Senator Warner, one minute. Alberto, you're right. Um, that COVID has exposed long existing uh, healthcare disparities with the Latino community, with the African American community, uh, and we need to do more. Um, one of the things, part of this is healthcare related, part of this is also economic related. I, I was very supportive of the PPP small business program, but we didn't do enough in terms of access to capital uh, for minority owned businesses. I've got a bill that actually working with the Trump administration, Secretary Mnuchin, will make record investments in community development financial institutions so that we can have that kind of lending to black owned, Latino owned, women owned businesses who fell behind. On healthcare, what we need to do, what we need to start with at least, is protecting the ACA. ACA is not perfect, but 20 million Americans got healthcare coverage. It protects three and a half million Virginians, including my daughter, with pre-existing conditions. 400,000 Virginians got health care coverage because of, of Medicaid expansion. My opponent has criticized me constantly for supporting the ACA. He said I was the deciding vote. And if he rushes through a Trump appointee, the ACA will be dismantled by the, by the Supreme Court, in that case, the second okay. week of November. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Gate, 30 seconds. 
Well, you're right. I have criticized you as being the deciding vote because there were 60 votes that got it from cloture to the floor, and that, that means that everybody who voted for it is the deciding vote. That's what I meant when I said it, and I'll say it again. Here's the fact. We absolutely, there, there are parts of the ACA that are fine. You know, the ACA has been law for 10 years, and the people who say we should repeal it root and branch are not thinking in, in terms of what is reality. So what we actually need to do is we need to, of course, protect people with pre-existing conditions. And then we need to expand access, increase quality to health care by doing things like expanding health savings accounts and by having price transparency. And the, and the administration, for all of its sometimes flaws, has done a good job on, on heading in that direction. Um, for, these next, uh, for this next question, we want to squeeze in two more virus questions before a commercial break. Um, we're going to ask that your answers be 30 seconds. Julie Carey with the next question. Senator Warren, I'm going to start with a direct quote. We are not okay. That was the conclusion of a Fauquier parent recently as she begged the school board to return to some in-person instruction. As hard as we know teachers are working and parents are praising those efforts, parents also say their kids are depressed, stressed, and simply not getting the education they deserve. So should more Virginia schools now be reopening their classrooms? Julie, I want schools to reopen, but I want them to reopen safely. And that decision ought to lay with the, lie with the parents, the school boards, the teachers, and not be dictated out of Washington. But Julie, I also think it's really important. We've got to get health care under control. My opponent can't have it both ways. He can't be against the ACA and say he's still going to protect people with pre-existing conditions. Don't take my word for it. Take the Cancer Society. Take the Diabetes Association. Take the AARP. This has been litigated for years. The repeal okay. and replace argument is a phony excuse. The ACA All is right. the only law of the land that protects people with pre-existing conditions. Dr. Gade, uh, your 30 seconds. Yeah, there were 25 states when the ACA was passed that had already protected people with pre-existing conditions. And the idea that I would take away uh, protections for people with pre-existing conditions is offensive and it's false and it's defamatory. Look, you can't see my body because I'm behind this podium, but I have a pre-existing condition myself because I got my leg blown off in Iraq. And since then, I've worked with people with disabilities. I've been on the National Council on Disability. There's nobody who cares more about people with pre-existing conditions in this country than I do. And the fact that he's putting out these ridiculous mailers. Listen, 2014 called market. Once it's campaign back, that's not who I am. It's a lie. Senator Warner, 15 seconds. Again, you can't have it both ways. If my opponent wants to change his position and say he supported my decision along with John McCain to keep the ACA, he can make that change. But you can't go out and criticize me for the ACA and then cherry pick which parts of the ACA you want to preserve. It just doesn't work that way. And again, don't believe me. Believe those who've been out there protecting folks, the Cancer Society, Diabetes okay. Association, the AMA, the list goes on and on. All right, uh, this last question before we go to break, 30 seconds to both of you. First to you, Dr. Gate. President Trump has talked about the possibility of a coronavirus vaccine before the November election. If he makes an announcement that a vaccine has been approved between now and November, would you be comfortable personally taking that vaccine? 30 seconds, Dr. Gate. Well, look, I, I'm, my family and I vaccinate our children. Um, if the science says the vaccine is safe, I'm happy to take it. But the truth is it won't be widely available for much longer than that. And I'm in a low risk category. I'm only 45 years old. I'm in peak physical condition despite my pre-existing condition. And I, I would just say that uh, I would allow people with, with uh, more advanced conditions to be the first ones to take the vaccine. And so uh, I think we need to prioritize to people who are most vulnerable as we look at rolling out the vaccine. But eventually, I'll happily take the vaccine. Senator Warner, your 30 seconds. Yes, I'll take it if Dr. Fauci says it's OK. Uh, but one of the things, as we get past the vaccine, we really need to look at what has happened to the FDA and the CDC. They were the gold standards. And unfortunately, um, they have not got this pandemic completely right. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that is due to political interference. All right, uh, I wanna pause it right there. A very lively and spirited first half of this debate. Thank you both so far. We're gonna take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back with many more questions for the candidates, starting with race, racial justice, and policing. And we are back with the two candidates for the United States Senator. Uh, 
for Virginia. I now want to turn to the other issue that has dominated national and state headlines over the past several months. I'm talking about race, racial justice, and policing. The idea of systemic racism is the concept that our systems of government, businesses, and justice were built to favor people who are white. Do you believe that systemic racism exists? And if so, uh, Senator Warner, what should the government do about it? Senator Warner, you get the first one minute answer. I think the history of race in our country has been challenging since over 400 years ago, the first enslaved people were landed at Port Comfort right here in Virginia. So do I think systemic racism exists? I do. Black Lives Matter. And I do think it's time that we put in place major criminal justice reforms. It's why I'm proud to be the co-sponsor of the Justice and Policing Act that would have a comprehensive approach to policing reform. I also believe that violence of any kind should be avoided. And so whether you're a vigilante on the street or about to throw a brick through the window, if you break the law, you should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. I believe as well that we should not be defunding the police. Matter of fact, if we're gonna give our police forces the tools they need, they will need additional training. I don't believe it's appropriate at times to send a law enforcement officer without the appropriate training into a mental health circumstance. There are lessons we can learn from countries around the world that don't have the, the level of police violence that we do in America. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Gade, do you believe uh, systemic racism exists? And if so, what should the government, should the government do something about it? There are absolutely still pockets of racism that exist in this country, Chuck. You're, you're actually right about that. And we need to find those and we need to stomp them out. And getting people updating their attitudes is the right way. I've been to the Lee Memorial after, the, after, the, uh, after it got painted, after it's been decorated with Black Lives Matter uh, uh, art. And I will just say that everybody has a right to, uh, to practice the First Amendment. I agree. Yes, protest. That's fine. But you don't start an important conversation with a rock in your hand. So what we need is fundamental police uh, reform. We need criminal justice reform. We need increased penalties for gun crimes, which the Virginia Democrats have voted down. We need funding for body cameras with, when, when there's federal funding involved. And we need training in recognizing mental health crises. I worked on the National Council on Disability. I understand what it's like to experience that from the eyes of somebody else. But defunding the police, as Mark's party has called for, is an evil idea because it puts the very same people at risk who are already at risk when police go rogue. And he's called for, uh, what did he say, reallocate police funding. That has one meaning, and it means defund. Senator Warner, 30 seconds. My opponent has been fact-checked on his claim about defunding the police, and he's been given a, I don't know how many, four Pinocchios, I believe it was, which means it's a lie. Uh, I do not support defunding the police. Can we train our police officers better? Absolutely. And this is an issue that I've worked on. One of the first laws that I helped become, become law in when I was governor of Virginia was making sure we had racial profiling training for our state police. Trying to make sure in 2015 I said I called uh, for body cameras. We can and must do better. But it can't just be around criminal justice reform. We need economic equality as well. And I hope we get to that subject, uh, Chuck, as well. Uh, we do. I have a quick follow for the both of you. You will each get 30 seconds for this question. Senator Warner, you first. You called for Governor Ralph Northam to resign after a blackface photo from a yearbook surfaced in early 2019, saying the governor lost the trust of Virginians. He did not resign. Did he ever regain your trust, Senator? Listen, I was very disappointed with the governor um, when that story broke out. I think, frankly, the governor reacted too quickly. I do think he has regained, in terms of um, ex accepting responsibility, he now says uh, that um, he was not in the picture. And I think he has worked extraordinarily hard to regain the trust of the people of Virginia. And uh, I think he's done a good job at that. And I think he's moved forward uh, this uh, agenda of bringing more racial justice. Uh, I think he's re-earned the support of uh, the Black Caucus in Virginia. And I think he's doing a good job handling the coronavirus. He is the only doctor in the country as a governor. He's following the science. Dr. Gade, uh, did Governor Northam make the right call by not resigning? 
Well, what you've just heard from Mark is another flip-flop. So there's flip Mark that said he should resign, and there's flop Mark that says he's regained the trust. But let's go back to the police issue and talk about flip-flopping. Just now you heard him say he's never been for defunding the police. But as governor, he signed a budget that defunded the police by 50 million dollars. And what happened is crime rates in Richmond went up, murders went up 10% year over year, and he said nothing about the millions in damage done in Richmond. And that's why I'm proud to announce today that I have the support of the Police Benevolent Association of Virginia, who endorsed Mark in 2008. Now they've seen that career politicians have failed, and it's time to try something new. Aaron Gilchrist has the next question. Aaron. Uh, Dr. Gade, in a recent campaign video, you decried what you've called violent left-wing extremists who are, in your words, destroying American cities. Uh, you've criticized Senator Warner and other leaders for caving to a woke mob. Uh, certainly there's been some violence in protests across the country, but there is now a massive movement across this nation that is calling for racial justice. What would you do to address those concerns around race, racial justice? Well, I was proud when I was in the Army to lead diverse teams, including in the most difficult circumstances you can imagine, in combat. And when I was wounded for the second time, 25 sailors and Marines I didn't know gave me their blood, and it didn't matter if they were black or white or gay or straight or Hispanic or anything else. So I think as Americans, we can come together to solve some of these hard issues. But let's be totally clear. There, there is a right to protest that is enshrined in the First Amendment, a right to have peaceable assembly that's enshrined in the, in the Constitution. But there's no place for organized left-wing violence. And what we see when, when you trace back the roots of Antifa, you see an organized movement to overthrow our government and to damage our system of democracy. And that's what I was talking about when I, when I said a woke mob. That's exactly what it is. And it's, when, when somebody's throwing a rock through a window, that's my definition of a mob. Senator Warner, one minute. I think there's a lot we can do to um, try to bring about greater racial, uh, racial justice in this country. I've laid out on criminal justice reform and policing reform, uh, but this is an issue I worked on long before I was in elective office. I used to sit on the board of Virginia Union, one of our historically black colleges, created the Virginia High Tech Partnership that for about 15 years got students from our historically black colleges into high tech internships. I was proud as governor uh, to do more investing and in business with minority-owned businesses, black-owned businesses, Latino-owned businesses, women-owned businesses than anyone in prior Virginia history. It's why I've worked actually with the Trump administration, Secretary Mnuchin and the Republican chairman of the Banking Committee to put the Jobs and Neighborhood Investment Act up, which will be in the next real COVID relief package which we should be working on now, not rushing through a Supreme Court justice that will make record investments in community development financial institutions that will, in, that will make the kind of lending and access to capital for minority-owned businesses that they didn't receive during the PPP program. There are things we can do, but it takes a proven record of actually Thank putting you. your, put, putting your actions where your words are. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Gate, 30 seconds. Well, the work on the COVID relief bill, which you just called for, is over because you voted against it and now it's dead. But let's be clear, you just talked about how you have the support of the police and you've worked with the police to help minority communities thrive and to reform policing. The Police Benevolent Association doesn't believe you, which is why they've endorsed me. They've switched their endorsement from you to me. And the reason is because I'm better on this issue. Let's point to one more thing. Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina put in a bill which would have had a variety of police reforms, but most importantly, it had a provision against lynching, and you voted against it because apparently it wasn't good enough for you, and you and your party called it token legislation, which is a coded dog whistle for, for a, a, a racial slur, to be honest with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gade. Aaron Gilchrist, next question. Uh, Senator, I want to ask you again about defund the police. The term is understood to mean both actual dismantling of police departments and reducing police budgets and functions to divert money to social service programs. Uh, you said it here today that you would not support defunding police, rather you favor criminal justice reforms and the like. Uh, how do you respond to people who say that uh, a lot of today's law enforcement dollars would be better spent on intervention and crisis management? I think we need to invest. And unfortunately in this country, uh, in, in many communities, it, can, it only takes 10 weeks to become a police officer. In many communities, in many countries, it takes two to three years.
I think we need to make the kind of investments in our police force to give them the tools and the training. We need to put the body cameras on police officers uh, so that we don't have uh, the kind of tragedy that took place a couple years ago with the Park Police uh, in the incident of Bijan Ghazar, um, who you can go and watch that video now, and we still have not gotten a response from the Justice Department uh, on, on that issue. We can and must stand by our police officers to give them the training they need. What I, uh, what, what I think, again, my opponent can say things, but saying things doesn't make them true. He's right, the police unions have stood up for him because they don't want to make any change. But when I was governor, we made record investments in law enforcement. Don't believe me, ask the sheriffs, ask law enforcement officers across the Commonwealth. I've got the record to prove it. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Gade, your one minute. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about your record, Mark. You defunded the police by $50 million when you were governor. It was in your 2004 budget, and crime rates went up after that. You've done nothing on police body cameras. You've done nothing to push federal resources to state and local governments so they can have the money to do that. And as a matter of fact, the bill that you're advocating for, along with your left-wing colleagues in the Senate, prohibits non-lethal methods like chokeholds. And that sounds fine for somebody who's never been in a gunfight or somebody who's never been in a physical fight. But let me tell you what actually happens on the ground when police officers are struggling with a suspect. If they can't use a chokehold sometimes, guess what they're going to reach for? They're going to reach for lethal means. They're going to reach for their pistol. And that's going to be the next killing that, that happens. And so if we take away tools from police, it's no wonder when violence goes up. And that's why I'm against that. That's why we need to have fundamental police reform. I've talked about that with the Police Benevolent Association. I told them about body cameras. I told them about my position on reforming uh, qualified immunity. And we need to do all of those things. But what we can't do is have the same old failed ideas and expect a different result. Okay. Senator Warner, you get 30 seconds. You know, um, I think that President Trump has been shown uh, by the Washington Post to have uh, committed over almost 20,000 lies in his uh, tenure. I, it appears my opponent is actually trying to catch up uh, with him today. Um, unfortunately, what my opponent just said just is not true. Uh, Virginians know me. They know my record of support for law enforcement. They know my record of support for trying to bring about a more just and equitable Virginia. They know the kind of investments I've worked on, not only in terms of criminal justice reform, but economic equality, equality in a technology-driven economy where we've got to make sure, no matter what zip code you come from, you've got those chances. Thank you. And I'm going to count on the people of Virginia who know my record. Thank you, Senator Alberto Pimienta has the next question. Alberto. Senator Warner, uh, this month an appeals uh, court in California ruled that the Trump administration can end a humanitarian relief program known as the Temporary Protective Status for individuals from several countries, including El Salvador. The program allow immigrants, uh, who allows immigrants who cannot safely return to their countries because of local conditions to live here in the U.S. legally. More than 20,000 recipients in Virginia could be impacted. Should the Senate block potential deportations, and if so, how? Senator Warner. The Senate should block um, the deportations of folks who came here, some almost 30 years ago under TPS. We see Salvadoran community, Honduran community, Nicaraguan community, and many of these individuals are now in the midst of pandemic essential workers. They work in our nursing homes. They work as aides in our hospitals. I think it is wrong morally, ethically, to try to deport these people during the midst of a pandemic. But what we also need, so I support continuation of the TPS program. On a going forward basis, could there be room for reform? Absolutely. But to take people who came here, oftentimes in the early 90s from Salvador, and have made their families here, to deport them in the midst of a pandemic would be wrong. But we also need broad-based immigration reform. And I was proud to work with John McCain and others back and got 69 votes on a comprehensive immigration reform. Wasn't perfect, but boy, to get 69 senators to agree on something that comprehensive, the problem was the then Republican controlled House never took it up. I believe with the new administration, we can take on immigration reform and right. give people the confidence they need to continue to participate in our country. Dr. Gade, one minute. Would you block those deportations? Yes, I believe so. I haven't seen the actual legislation or the bill, but I, I believe I would. And here's why. Because America is a generous country, and we've always welcomed people who are suffering. 
That allows me to switch, switch over to immigration. Here's what I'd say about immigration. Our immigration policy should serve America, and of course we need to secure our border. And you know, the, the president says build the wall, that's shorthand for secure the border. Of course we need to welcome low-skilled workers who do very important work, provided that we uh, know who they are, where they are, they pay taxes, and they go back when they're done. We're happy to have those folks. But an area where I break with my party is on H-1B visas. We need to have H-1B visa workers, especially in Northern Virginia, especially in the technology sector. And the administration has, has curtailed H-1B visas, and I think that's a mistake, and it's an area in which I disagree with my party. But you know what you see here is you see career politicians constantly trying to use immigration as a, as a cudgel for the next election instead of solving it right now. And Republicans do it too, but I'm not gonna. You can always count on me to tell you the truth, and that's what I'm doing right now. Senator Warner, 30 seconds. I'm glad to hear Mr. Gade finally break with his party, at least on one item. Um, but the truth is, it has been this Trump administration, whether it's banning people from Muslim countries, whether it's being as anti-immigrant as any president in our history of our country. Uh, and I disagree with him. I think we ought to secure our borders, but I think there's smarter ways than a wall. There's a ways to use drones and technology, not a fourth century technology. And I do, and again, Mr. Gage should do his homework. I've worked with the Northern Virginia Chamber, the high tech community here to support additional H-1B visas. I've worked on the issue of trying to raise the country cap on countries like India, which support enormous amount of uh, uh, high-tech, knowledge-based workers. The Indian American diaspora is an important part of Virginia. I think Virginia is a richer and more diverse commonwealth now. And that, that investment of immigrants, over a third of the tech jobs Thank and tech businesses in Northern Virginia Thank are founded by immigrants. We need to welcome Thank that. Thank you, Senator. You blew through our stop it's, sign. It's uh -huh. not uh -huh. enough, Mark. Uh -huh. It's not point. enough, Mark. You haven't gotten it done. All right, all right, guys. Uh, we're moving to a new topic here. Julie Carey with the next question. Dr. Gate, as you well know, for the first time this November, Virginia voters will be able to cast mail-in ballots early without an absentee excuse, and those who choose can return them through drop boxes. It's estimated at least 60% of Virginians will cast their votes via mail this election. How confident are you in the security of Virginia's vote? Well, I've got some concerns, but let me start with a little story that I think is really, really awesome. When I was in Iraq in August, I'm sorry, November of 2004, I and all of my soldiers cast our absentee ballots around the country in the, uh, in the 2004 presidential and, you know, of course, uh, state and local elections. And I was proud to cast an absentee ballot. And throughout my 25 years of military service, I cast an absentee ballot many, many times. The post office can handle the absentee ballots. They can keep the chain of custody intact. But what we've seen in Virginia this year is terrifying for three reasons. Number one, the idea of unattended drop boxes is one step away from somebody squirting some lighter fluid and throwing in a road flare, and then those ballots are gone forever. Two, the fact that they've gotten away from the ability to have a signature associated with an actual person and an ID means that anybody can vote with your name, and then when you go in, your name is already taken and you'll have to cast a provisional ballot. And three, they've recently put something in place where they think that ballots can come in until Friday after Election Day that will still affect the Tuesday, November 3rd election. And all three of those undermine the security of our elections, which is one of the most critical things that Americans can do. Thank you, Dr. Gade. Senator Warner, one minute. This is, again, an area where I dramatically disagree uh, with my opponent. He is taking the Donald Trump approach on voting. Let's try to restrict it as much as possible. I'm glad we've got early voting. I've already voted. Uh, and I trust uh, the post office to get the job done only because of the postal workers. I think it's been outrageous, President Trump's political appointee, the Postmaster General, trying to interrupt mail service, and the data is out there, to slow down during the middle of the pandemic, not only ballots, but people who depend on a pa during the pandemic on the mail to get their medicines and, and their bills paid. I think it was wrong. Thank goodness that Postmaster General got called out. Um, we have to vote. We need to vote in record numbers, whether you're for me or for Mr. Gay. Get out and vote. But we've got to also make sure we do it early. I trust the absentee process. I think we need to open up voting. But we also have to guard, and this is something, as you know, I've been working on for the last three and a half years, about foreign interference. Uh, election interference, disinformation, information, misinformation, and I hope we had a question on that as well. Dr. Gate, 30 seconds. 
Well, I, I, I saw a video of Mark voting, and I couldn't help but think that he might have gone in and voted for me. So if you did, Mark, I really appreciate that. Look, I encourage all of my supporters to go vote early as well. I'm going to vote on November 3rd because my daughter, who's 18, is coming home from college, and she's going to cast her first Senate ballot. And I'm not even going to ask her who she's going to vote for, but I bet I know. And here's the thing. Um, I'm encouraging all my people, to, all my voters to vote early so that they can take others to the polls. Look, I've, I'm in favor of the maximum number of citizens voting. I think that's a good idea. But what I'm not in favor of is insecure elections which undermine our democracy and continue to cause uh, uh, fear in our electoral right. system. Uh, I want to stick with this topic. It's the final question, 30 seconds to both of you. Are you confident that the result of this contest will be fair? And will you accept the results from the presidential election, regardless of who's declared the winner, first to Senator Warner? I will, of course, accept the results. But I think we all have a responsibility, those of us who are elected leaders, Chuck, those of you in the media, to make sure that we all take a deep breath. This is a COVID time. Things may be a little different. We may not know who's the winner on election night. And we already have a sitting president who's, trying to, who's saying that he might not accept the results. That is unprecedented in our history. That plays into the hands of folks like Vladimir Putin who want to undermine our democracy. Okay. I will accept those results, but we need to make sure the votes are all counted. Dr. Gay, do you expect this election to be fair? And will you accept the results of the presidential election? I absolutely will accept the results of the presidential election, no question about it. I'll accept the results of the Senate election, and I'll accept the results up and down the ballot. What we need to do, though, is we need to make sure that going forward, our elections are secure, because election security is national security. And there are some people on left and right who've been talking about this for a long time, the fact that the Russians interfered in our 2016 election, not to try to get Donald Trump elected necessarily, but instead to try to undermine confidence in the electoral system. And that's a real problem. They have not undermined my confidence in America or in our electoral system. Gentlemen, that concludes our questions. And now, Dr. Gade, you have a one-minute closing statement. Um, go ahead. Well, Chuck, uh, again, and to the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce and Senator Warner, thank you for this uh, spirited exchange of ideas. It's actually been a lot of fun. Um, as a non-career politician, this is my first time being on the big debate stage, and I really appreciate you uh, uh, exchanging your ideas with me in a, in a forthright and exciting way. But all you need to do is look at Washington, D.C., and to realize that it's a dysfunctional mess. Politicians on both sides of the aisle have made it worse, blown out budgets, endless wars that affect people just like me, partisan bickering over the simplest tasks, and grandstanding to win the next election. What you've seen today here is a perfect illustration of how career politicians want to have it both ways. I've introduced you to Flip Mark and then his alter ego, Flop Mark. But we agree on one thing. In 1996, right after promising not to run for a third term if he was elected to Senate, Mark said this, the value of our system is that it's constantly renewed by new ideas, fresh ideas, and fresh people. In this election, Virginians can choose a new, fresh face, or they can choose a career politician. I humbly ask for your vote, and okay. I look forward to a spirited exchange of ideas Thank over the next 40 days. Thank you, Dr. Gate. Now, Senator Warner, your final remarks. Well, thank you, Chuck, and thank you to the Virginia Chamber. And I thank um, Mr. Gade for uh, his b willingness to be in the arena and um, run in politics and in challenging times. You know, I'm a real, with all our challenges, I'm a real optimist about our country. You know, I've been blessed to live the American dream. You know, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. Uh, my first two businesses failed, but I had that third try. And I, one of the things why I am so interested in continuing in public service is to try to make sure everybody has the kind of same kind of fair shot that I've had. We gotta realize the world is changing though. It's technology driven. We need people who understand that change. So that again, no matter what zip code you live in, you're gonna have that fair shot that I had. We also know that we've gotta to work together. Whether it's been governor or senator, whether it's been my work on the Senate Intelligence Committee, I've had a bipartisan record of getting things done. That record I offer to the people of Virginia, and respectfully, I ask and would hope to earn your vote again. Thank you all. Uh, Senator Mark Warner, Dr. Daniel Gade, thank you both for your participation. Thank you to the Northern Virginia Chamber, the Shar School, and NBC4 for making tonight's debate possible. 
and of course the two candidates be safe out there on the campaign trail. And thank you also to our panel, NBC 4's Aaron Gilchrist and Julie Carey and Telemundo 44's Alberto Pimienta. Stay with News 4 and NBCWashington.com for continuing coverage of Decision 2020. And don't forget not only to vote, but plan how you're going to vote on or before November 3rd.